Hi, welcome to the last uh, pre-recorded science lecture of the series for Ziri of Summer School. My name is Amrita Zodan. I am a postdoc at Caltech. And today I would be trying to convince you as to why millisecond pulsars are some of the very interesting systems that we can find with CDF. So Zwicky Transient Facility, as you've heard previously in this school, has a staggering field of view of about 47 degrees square. And by combining private and public data sets, we can go down to optical magnitudes, which are as low as 21. Now, if you combine the rapid all sky coverage ability uh, with a cadence as low as three to one days, depending on if you're looking at the galactic plane, ZDF with its field of view and this cadence together can provide a really rich transient archive. For example, in one of the recent data reviews, we have 106 billion sources with each of them uh, 50 to 1000 times being observed with GNR band. We also have 2 billion unique light curves that we can look through to find interesting compact objects. Now on this theme, you've heard talks from Kevin and Ilaria about how CDF is a great search machine for looking at white dwarfs. Now, when it comes to neutron stars, there are different manifestations that CDF can help us track. For example, we can follow up gravitational wave events uh, using CDF rapid optical monitoring with a program led by Mansi Kaslival et al. called Growth uh, to track gravitational wave counterparts. Secondly, uh, cataclysmic variables that comprise neutron star binaries uh, could also be found, for example, AMCTN systems, which recently found by von Rustel et al. Thirdly, fast radio bursts are theorized uh, to come from really uh, intensely magnetic pulsars called magnetars. And so fast radio bursts uh, can also be tracked by using the or using CDF, uh, and you can find it in a recent work by Andreo Nieto. So the systems that I am interested in are pulsars in X-ray binaries and radio millisecond pulsar binaries. Now, radio, so the X-ray binaries image, you can see the schematic in the top right, where there is a companion that has uh, exceeded its own Roche lobe and is able to dump mass and angular momentum by forming an accretion disk around the neutron star. The bottom schematic shows a millisecond pulsar in a radio state where the companion is being ablated by winds from the pulsar. Now there are different types of radio millisecond pulsars and we have named them based on cannibalistic spiders called black widows, redbacks and huntsmen because the winds from pulsar are slowly eating away the companion. If you look at the pulsar population, uh, today we know of about 2,659 pulsars. And if we take a conservative criteria that any pulsar that rotates faster than 50 times in a second is a rapidly rotating millisecond pulsars, we currently are looking at a population of about 359 millisecond pulsars. In this diagram, which shows the intrinsic spin period of a pulsar against its spin period derivative, we can classify pulsars into different groups. And on this diagram, you also see sweeps of characteristic age, for example, here, magnetic fields, as you can see here. And these sweeps further help us understand where you know the properties of these classes. For example, we can start out with young pulsars, which are born right after a supernova explosion. And it's acting as a dipole that's emanating electromagnetic radiation, which takes away the energy from pulsar and it slowly spins down to this state called, uh, this new subgroup called normal pulsars. Now, some of these younger pulsars have intense magnetic fields, as you can see here, of the order of 10 to 14 Gauss. And these are pulsars on steroids called magnetars. 
Now, young pulsars, as they enter this phase of normal pulsars over their lifetime of about a few million years, they would keep spinning down and losing energy and enter a zone called pulsar graveyard. Now, pulsar graveyard is not where the pulsar is actually dead, but where the emission is so low that we are not able to observe it. In this pulsar graveyard, if this pulsar has a companion that can transfer mass and angular momentum onto the pulsar, it can be rejuvenated all the way and spin to millisecond period. So it would end this pulsar graveyard phase after the accretion phase, as we had seen in the schematic on an earlier slide, and enter a millisecond pulsar binary state. Now, millisecond pulsars are really cool objects because they have multiple applications. For example, we can use pulsar timing array to study and detect supermassive black hole mergers. We can use double pulsar and exotic triple pulsar systems to test general relativity in some of the strongest gravity regimes. We can also study neutron star black hole and binary neutron star mergers uh, and understand uh, the current population of millisecond pulsars by using these mergers as key uh, for population uh, rates. Thirdly, millisecond pulsars are some of the most exciting laboratories in the world to study extreme states of matter. And uh, one of the fun applications of pulsars is it can act as a galactic uh, triangulation system where we can uh, say where we are located based on this pulsar. So it's like a galactic GPS as was seen in the gold record for Voyager. Now in the population of millisecond pulsars, if you look at this plot of number of uh, currently recycled millisecond pulsars that we know versus spin frequency, you would see that very few of them exist above a frequency of about 500 Hertz. Secondly, most of the pulsars that are found uh, as millisecond pulsar binaries are in binaries. So we would expect uh, them to have the kind of impinging um, effect of pulsar wind ramming into the companion as we had seen before. Secondly, if you plot companion masses of these pulsars against orbital periods of the binaries, uh, in case of millisecond pulsars, we see different subclasses. So black widows and red back kind of pulsars, which are short orbital, pulsar binaries uh, are seen in the masses, uh, companion masses of about 10 to minus one uh, and greater. And then there are other interesting pulsar binaries, such as for example, a pulsar with the planet next to it, the planet pulsar that was found in uh, 1957 plus, uh, and pulsars such as 1957 plus 12, which exist at much lower companion masses. And then of course there are canonical uh, pulsar, millisecond pulsars. Now, theoretically, Shen and Torius in 2013 and Stefan et al. 2018 say that uh, if you have these kind of pulsar binary subgroups, uh, we wouldn't really be seeing them uh, move from one subgroup to the other. And these are very different populations based on their origin. So finding more of these millisecond pulsars, especially towards the lower companion masses, can help us fill that gap and understand if really these populations are statistically different. So now this is where ZDF comes in. If you, this is a Mollivit projection of ZDF uh, observable pulsars. So all the pulsars uh, are depicted in gray. The millisecond pulsars are shown in blue. And of these millisecond pulsars, the ones that are in binaries are shown in uh, yellow. So a lot of them are observable and detectable by ZDF. And the reason ZDF can detect millisecond pulsars uh, with companion is because as we had said before, if you do have a pulsar with a companion next to it, the pulsar wind, energetic pulsar wind, wind would ram into this companion, leading to an intrabinary shock. This shock then gives rise to X-ray emission, optical emission, and UV. Now, if you're looking at this emission in different wave bands, for example, in X-rays, you would see a hard spectrum emission with a spectral index of about 1.14 to 1.5. And you would also see gamma ray emission that is uh, arising from the same intrabinary shock. If you're looking at the top-down view of this system, for example, the observer could be either at 0.25 or 0.5 or 0.75, 
you would be sampling different parts of the central binary shock, leading to a sinusoidal optical emission. And the proof of this concept lies in going after currently known red bags and black widows, which is what we did recently. And we could recover them using ZDF data. So in each of this panel, the top plot shows long-term ZDF light curve, and the bottom panel shows ZDF light curve folded at the known orbital periods of these red bags or black widow type of pulsar beta rays. And so what you can see is that in uh, the left topmost panel, one of the coolest thing that we could do was if you look at grub clusters, it's usually really hard to isolate different pulsars by just using radio observations. But by using ZDF, we could seek out optical companion for J1518 plus 0204C, which previously required a deep HST observation to be able to find out the companion. Secondly, in these uh, panels, you can see that we could also recover a really rapidly rotating pulsar 1810 plus 1744 with a period of about 1.66 millisecond. So the reason we could recover this is because we knew there is a Fermi source and uh, then people could go after it using radio observation to find the pulsar in GBT drift scan survey. And then from that drift scan survey, we had an idea of where the pulsar is located and we could find it out uh, using the CTF data set. And you can see that in this pulsar system, the eclipses are so deep and it's so quickly apparent that there is definitely uh, you know, an eclipsing binary here. Now, thirdly, one of the systems that I work a lot with is Pulsar 1023 plus 0038. This is a pulsar that is called a transitional millisecond pulsar system. So it goes from this accretion state of the pulsar that we had seen before to the radio millisecond pulsar state really rapidly on time scales, which are as short as few weeks. And these systems are really key to understanding, okay, why do pulsars get recycled to these insane periods uh, while they are in the pulsar graveyard? So we could recover 1023 plus 0038 uh, also with CDF data set. Now, one of the things that I would like you to notice is if you look at, for example, this pulsar, which is on the bottom panel, 2215 uh, plus 5135, you can see that this red back uh, pulsar has a really different mass ratio of the companion is to pulsar, and therefore these eclipses are significantly deeper compared to other systems. Similarly, in the red back, uh, zero, um, J10, J2339 minus 0533, you also see deep eclipses. So one thing that we can keep in mind is when we are going after these sources with CDF, if there is a higher mass asymmetry, we have an easier time detecting and finding these kind of systems. So now, as you see in this panel, a lot of these millisecond pulsars have Fermi counterpart. And so this is the technique that we've been using to go after red backs and black widow systems, because for me, the recent 4FGL catalog that was released has about 3.1 million sources and they were fitted iteratively uh, in Fermi spectra. So 4FGL uh, catalog from Fermi has significant improvements in form of uh, improvements in galactic diffuse emission, variable ROIs and spectral fits for pulsar versus other sources. The other thing that we can do when we are using Fermi as a treasure map uh, to find out if a certain uh, system that we currently do not know of, for example, it's an unknown, unassociated Fermi counterpart, if it's a pulsar or not, one of the things that really helps is looking at their gamma ray emission in different energy bands. So towards the lower uh, energies, 100 to 300 MeV, you're sampling a lot more of the diffuse background emission. And as you go towards higher and higher um, energy ranges, the more and more apparent it becomes that you're only zooming on uh, to the compact object, uh, such as a pulsar binary in this case. So higher energy cutoffs are also important. So we are using higher energy cutoffs and the known spectral properties. So for example, uh, Fermi currently has about 1,336 unassociated sources. 
And as we had mentioned before, that these sources are iteratively fitted. So 4FGL uses different spectral shifts for this iterative fitting. Um, there is a power law where we have non-curved sources, power law with sub-exponential cutoffs for significantly curved pulsars, and log normal uh, kind of uh, for all the curved sources spectra. And now if you look at these spectral shapes, so for example, power law with exponential cutoff, uh, and you look at the different indices in these fits for all of the known Fermi sources and different exponential factor, towards the range of lower uh, indices of exponential cutoffs and higher exponential factors, we start finding out more and more pulsar binaries, as you can see in the blue region here. Similarly, if you look at the peak energy, as we had said before that, you know, the higher energies that you go at, the more, like, more is the likelihood that you would be looking at a pulsar binary in Fermi data sets. So if you take the E peak that was used to fit the spectra, and if you focus on a peak energy that is um, at least one GeV and above, and at the same time, the log normal parabolas uh, index beta, if it is set to a value of about 0.6 and higher, we are also again looking at pulsar binary population. So currently, this is what we've done. We have looked at about 355 Fermi sources. And because Fermi sources, uh, Fermi has much larger error circles, we have broken up those error circles by using something called as a hexagonal packing and launch rapid period finding algorithms such as long scargle or conditional entropy to seek out if there are any periodicities present in optical data sets in these Fermi circles. We have also used X-ray correlations by using large scale available data sets from SWIFT and ROSAT and checked their spectral indices to only find, as I had mentioned before, you see hard spectral indices if you're looking at X-ray emission from millisecond pulsars to only find hard spectral sources within these ranges. And we have some really interesting potential candidates that we are looking at right now. So for example, uh, this is again a similar panel as you had seen before where light curves are on top and folded light curves are on the bottom. We have some interesting systems with periods as low as 0.142 days or uh, about 0.74 days, which is where we expect red back uh, kind of sources to exist. We also have some of the larger period systems, which is 4.359 days. And then uh, keep in mind that if you fold data sets with different periodicity, you can also fold it with a month long duration and you would see some of the, the so things that do look like sources, but can be more of this just you know, 30 degree, 30 days fold from a month long cadence. So in summary, ZDF is an excellent way to monitor known redbacks and black widow systems in the Northern sky above a declination of 31 degrees. Uh, for me, ZDF candidates, are uh, being vetted optically and using X-ray pulsation searches. And we are now um, finding more and more interesting systems there. Uh, thirdly, as we had said before that CDF is an excellent way to monitor pulsar binaries, we have constructed something called as a pulsar binary sentinel where we construct uh, light curves of known pulsars, uh, whether as X-ray binaries or radio millisecond pulsars and track how they evolve from, you know, over a very short time scale to see if they have any changes in their state, if they're suddenly in, you know, entered an accretion state or not. Lastly, these kind of neutron star searches by using optical domain is important as we are entering um, optical survey dominated era with LSST. And soon you might hear more about these kind of searches for pulsar binaries or compact eclipsing objects uh, by using machine learning from Ashish and others in this series. Uh, thank you so much for listening to me about how ZDF can be a really fun way to look at pulsar binaries and hope you have a great time in this summer school. I would like to end my talk by thanking the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk here. Thank you.